So hello all, welcome back to the lifelong learning course. Um, and today we're in week 11, where we have a particular special guest lecture by Massimo Caccia on task agnostic continual reinforcement learning. Before we get to this um, guest lecture, um, let's briefly say some words about Massimo. Of course, I thank him for, for being here and doing this lecture in the first place. Um, he's from the Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, Mila, and he's a um, like pretty final PhD student. He's also an intern at DeepMind right now, and he's working on continued learning, mainly the questions on algorithms that are able to accumulate transferable knowledge and skills that enable better and faster generalization. And accordingly, he's of course working continual and meta-learning. And so with that, um, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Um, so yes, the topic of the day is task agnostic continual RL. And um, just to give you a bit of context, um, so I just wrote a paper with all of these uh, beautiful people here on the subject. It's a pretty empirical paper, a paper that um, talks about some observations in task ag ag agnostic continual RL. And um, so basically I changed a bit my usual presentation such that it fits more in a continual uh, learning class. So basically I'm, I'm beefing up the first part of the presentation that explains task agnostic continual RL, but you will still hear me talk about my paper uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so that's the, just a bit of context. Okay, so TLDR. Um, I'm gonna give you more context. So I'm, I've been interested in continual learning for a while now. And like the average uh, continual learning researcher, I've been working on continual supervised learning data sets and more specifically in these image uh, classification tasks. Um, so now the, the problem is, sorry, Martin, I'm hearing some, uh, some background noise. I think you're, you're not unmuted, at least on, on my side. Maybe you're muted on YouTube, but, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, yes. So my motivation for working on continual learning is, is mostly that one day we'll be able to deploy these learning agents in an open world and they will accumulate knowledge. Um, and as they accumulate knowledge, they will become smarter and smarter, learn faster and faster, require less and less data to learn a specific skill, and eventually they will reach you know, general intelligence. Okay, So this is kind of my motivation for doing continual learning. But I've convinced myself that um, continual supervised learning, the, the traditional benchmarks in vision, they're not aligned enough with this use case. So I've kind of refactored myself as a, a researcher in continual reinforcement learning, because I feel it's more aligned with my motivation of you know deploying this little agent in the world that autonomously learn. So this is just my perspective. You know, now I'm, I study uh, continual reinforcement learning and I'm gonna try to convince you that uh, it's a good playground to do research in if you're also excited about if you share my motivation uh, that I just explained, okay? So uh, here's an overview of the presentation. Um, you are now probably continual learning experts at this point, but I will still do a quick background on the subject. Then I will quickly introduce reinforcement learning, and then we'll dive right into task agnostic continual RL. Um, so I'll explain the problem statement and give out some examples, give out some motivations. And then I will talk about some soft upper bounds that we study in uh, task agnostic continual RL. And um, these soft upper bounds are analogs in continual supervised learning. So it's the task awareness upper bound and the multitask learning upper bound. Um, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you have used them, uh, but I will explain them during the presentation. And then we'll dive in more into the, what is specific about the paper uh, I wrote. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, a bit about the backbone algorithm uh, that we used in the experiments. So in this case, it's soft actor critic. So it's a really uh, neat uh, reinforcement learning algorithm that I uh, like and that is, works really well. 
Um, I will talk about some baselines we used, and then we'll dive into the observations I've made in um, in um, in this, some cool continual reinforcement learning benchmarks. And just to give you a hint, um, it's one observation is that there's a specific reinforcement learning reinforcement learning algorithm that doesn't seem to suffer from uh, catastrophic forgetting, really. It's just able to learn on unstationary data uh, as good as when it learns on stationary data. So I think that's a really neat observation. And uh, hopefully, I can convince you that it's neat as well. Um, OK, so background time, continual learning. So uh, every continual learning researcher has its own um, continual learning definition. So at least mine is that continual learning focuses on this idea uh, of accumulating knowledge on non-stationary data. Okay, So accumulating knowledge on a data distribution that changes over time. Uh, why is this interesting for me? Well, as I said in the TLDR, I think that uh, through an accumul accumulation of knowledge, the algorithm can become more sample efficient and more compute efficient, so that such that it can learn harder tasks, and then so on and so on. You know, um, so that's kind of my definition and motivation of continual learning. But sadly, as you have probably seen in the class earlier, um, machine learning or deep learning algorithms they don't really work well on um, changing data distribution. So, if you train on a specific task and your algorithm, your algorithm uh, successfully uh, performs the task and then you train it on a new task, well, the performance on the previous task will quickly drop and we call this, you know, catastrophic forgetting. So, right now, the field of continual learning mostly focuses on, on solving this problem because it's a really bad problem if you want to accumulate knowledge, right? Um, yeah, why do we care about continual learning? Well, so I have kind of three arguments for continual learning, and I'll start by the most boring one, and then I'll increase in um, how I like them, okay? So the first one is like the industry deployment uh, argument. So a lot of applications of machine learning, they will need to handle non-stationary data distribution. So maybe I have a platform that has users and items, and maybe uh, somehow the news impacts what's happening on the platform. Um, I will need an algorithm that need, that can handle non-stationary data distribution, um, unless I want to. You know, the, the 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 other thing I can do is have a team of human just keep re that's always retraining the model, uh, but. Hopefully, continual learning can replace that team of human and with a, like an autonomous learning system that can learn on stationary data. So that's kind of like one motivation for me to do continual learning. One that's a bit more exciting to me is the curriculum learning uh, curriculum learning argument. And I think you've had a class on cur uh, curriculum learning, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But uh, the argument is. Um, Let's say I want to build a robot that plays uh, soccer or football. Um, probably it will be faster uh, to learn that task if I can first learn how to stand up and then learn how to walk and then learn how to run and so on and so on. So um, to do proper curriculum learning, you need a tool that you need a learning agent that can learn on non-stationary data or changing data distribution. So I think if we want to deliver on the promises that curriculum learning promised, then we need to solve continual learning. And then my last argument, which is kind of related to the one I just said, is this argument of like uh, deploying these learning agents autonomously in an open world till they can you know, reach general intelligence. So that's kind of uh, my uh, North Star. and. Uh, that's that's why I think we really need uh, continual learning. Okay, so that was some motivations. Um, now we're gonna jump into reinforcement learning, and I'm I'm going to assume that um, you guys have zero knowledge of reinforcement learning. So we're really gonna start 
from the ground up. Um, okay, so reinforcement learning is this framework where uh, there's an agent that's embedded in a world and this agent perform actions and it's, it, the name of the game in uh, reinforcement learning is to find a policy. Normally, uh, it's a, we refer to that policy as pi. We want to find a policy that accumulates as much reward as possible in this world. Okay. Now, the simplest, the the playground we mostly study uh, reinforcement learning in is what we call the Markov decision process, or for short, MDP. Okay. And this is uh, a graph of um, the MDP. So basically you have an agent that I colored in uh, blue here. So the agent is in a particular state. It's going to take a particular action. Then the world or the environment is going to uh, return a reward to that agent depending on the state action pair. So the agent is going to tell the, no, sorry, the environment is going to tell to the agent how valuable the action was in that particular state. And afterwards, the environment will throw the agent in a new state, depending on the state action pair. Okay. So um, here, you can think about the blue line as uh, the agent. You can think about the orange lines as the reward function. Okay. And then you can think about the purple line as the dynamics of the environment. Okay. So an MDP normally is parameterized by its um, dynamics, so the purple lines, and then the reward function, the orange lines. Okay. So hopefully that was kind of clear. The, the agent is in a state, does an action, returns a reward, then goes to the next state. Um, now, what's particular about the MDP is that the states are, one, Markovian, and two, they are fully observable by the agent. Okay, so what does it mean? The states are Markovian means that the past time steps are completely irrelevant to the agent in order to take optimal actions. Okay, so basically the state variable it encodes all of the information that is important for the agent is relevant to the agent to perform to choose an action that will give him good rewards. Okay, so the essentially the agent can forget about the last time steps when it's taking a decision. And the other uh, characteristic of MDP is that uh, the states are fully observable. So that means that all of the variables that control the world are directly observed by the agent. So basically the agent with its sensors at any given time has access to all of the variables that um, control the world okay so that's that's a really really uh, limiting uh, assumption i think um, with mdps you can do like little things like play certain video games that are one markovian and two fully observable like in pac-man for example and you can also play board games where um, you always observe uh, the full state of the world um, and again it's markovian um, so yeah, with MDPs, you can do these cute little things, but if we really want to deploy um, reinforcement learning algorithm in the wild, we need to we need a more general uh, framework, I think, which we often call a PMDPs, so partially observable MDPs. Okay, so now what changed is the states of the environment this uh, S variable, it is now hidden from the agent. This is why it's in gray. The agent is only going to observe a child of um, the states, which we'll call X. So now we'll call X the observations, and we'll call S the state of the world, okay? So now this framework, um, it's much more, this framework is much more general because now 
there can be interesting things happening beyond the sensors, the current, the current things that the agent is observing with its sensors. Okay, so like uh, for example, right now me, I'm probably in a PomDP maximizing some kind of reward function, and there's a lot of things happening that's outside my uh, sensors, right? Um, maybe the stock market is currently changing and this has an impact on my portfolio. Uh, maybe uh, one of my paper is getting reviewed right now and somehow I will get a negative reward later when it gets rejected. So a lot of things are happening uh, beyond our sensors, which I, th which I think motivates this idea of the PomDP. And to take optimal actions in a PomDP, now you need to condition on all the previous time steps, okay? Because we're now relaxing this assumption that um, everything you need is in the current observation, okay? But I'll, we'll circle back to this uh, later. Because obviously, um, conditioning your agent on all the previous time step of his life at every, every time he needs to make a prediction obviously doesn't scale. So we'll see a workaround for this, okay? Um, so that's the PomDP. And with PomDP, now you can do more exciting things, like maybe play a poker game where a lot is happening beyond your current observation, right? You don't know the cards of your enemies. You don't know which cards will go, will eventually be turned. So uh, now you can play poker. And uh, maybe you can also do robotics. So um, why do I think PomDP is very important for robotics? Well, let's take a stupid example. Let's think about a robot that's helping you build a house. Well, at any given time, the robot with its sensors, it cannot, uh, just with its current sensors, it cannot re know what is the current state of the house, the house with their building, and what everyone is working on, uh, or what everyone is, ach is achieving right now. Um, so what I'm trying to say is the robot needs to keep a working memory of what it's doing, what's the state of the house, what uh, other people are doing, because its current sensors is not enough to tell him what's the next optimal action it should take. Okay, so um, if you want to build robots or if you want to deploy, oh, sorry, if you want to um, build robots or and if you want to deploy uh, agents in the world, I think the PomDP is a much better work than the NDP. Okay. Um, okay. So, hopefully, I've convinced you that the PomDP is uh, important to study. Now, what what I'm going to try to do is explain this setting called Task Agnostic Continual RL as a special case of the PomDP. Okay. Because the problem with the PomDP is it's over general. It's uh, all the, the, the solutions are intractable. And um, I think it, yeah, it's over general and we can make some assumption to align it more with uh, our use case, okay? So basically I'm gonna try to make some assumptions uh, on the PMDP. And as we make this assumption, we'll closely converge to task agnostic continual RL. Okay, and um, as we do this assumption, I will always circle back to a running example, okay? And uh, this running example will be a physiotherapist robot, okay? So basically, this physiotherapist robot, its life or its world is to uh, first, so when it gets a new client, it needs to do some exploration to understand what the, the, the problem of the client is. So basically it's doing a diagnostic. And when this diagnostic is done, hopefully it's correct. And then the robot can start treating the issue of the client, okay? So that's kind of like the robot I have in mind. And because everyone is different, maybe this robot is, 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 needs some continual learning to, to accumulate knowledge as it sees more and more clients, okay? So that's kind of, uh, that will be the running example, okay? So the first thing we'll do is uh, we'll kind of reparameterize uh, the MDP, uh, the PMDP, okay? So it's gonna look ugly at first, but essentially what I did now is I just 
um, separated the, um, the, the, the state variable in two pieces, okay? There's now the piece where that's hidden from the user, and the rest is just what the user observes, uh, the, the agent observes, okay? So now uh, I've separated these two, and you'll understand later why. Sadly, now there's all these new connections in it. Uh, but essentially, we're talking about the same object here. It's just a different view on the PONDP. Okay, so uh, what is this? What is this? Okay, so now what is nice with, with this view is we can, uh, we can explore the two mechanisms by which the hidden state of the world can change the, 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 ex the experience of the agent. So in the purple line, we can see how the hidden state changes the dynamics of the world. And in the orange line, we can see how the hidden state changes the reward function. Okay. And we'll, we will circle back to those later. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do now, you know, remember, we're trying to simplify the problem, trying to make it more tractable and more aligned with our use case. So, and our use case is this idea of, of like deploying an agent that can accumulate knowledge, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make this hidden state really simple. Where it's just gonna be a categorical variable that represents, uh, that we often call context or task, okay? So we're simplifying this hidden state. Um, so in the, in the running example of the physiotherapist robot, you can think about this categorical uh, variable as a certain uh, a certain issue that someone uh, a certain physical issue that would bring someone to see a physiotherapist. Okay, um, so now, yeah, this categorical variable we'll call it a task variable. Okay, represents the issue of the client. Next thing we'll do is we will assume that this uh, variable. It is locally stationary. What I mean by that is we're going to assume that it is, when it changes, it stays constant for a while. So basically, we're not, at every time step, we're not changing, um, we're not changing what the client problem is, okay? We're going to assume that the, the, the client we're currently uh, treating has the same issue for a while, okay? So that's, Kind of the first assumption we're going to make, and I think this is a valid assumption in, 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 we, can, we can make because um, us in real life, when we're deployed, we will cook for 30 minutes and then we'll drive for 40 minutes. We're not constantly changing the task we're doing at every time step, right? So I think this is a valid assumption, and also we, it gets us closer to this idea of accumulating knowledge in the real world, um, and then. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Okay, so you see there's this link between uh, actions and the hidden state. Um, I think this this doesn't need to be uh, studied now. Okay, so basically this, if we go back to the running example, this would mean that the agent has an effect on the issue of the client, which doesn't make much sense okay, in this use case. So I cannot change the issue of my uh, client from one time step to the other. So I'm going to remove this link uh, uh, that causes that where the agent can cause the task variable to change. Okay. Now, this hidden state or this now task variable, uh, we remember that it's changing the dynamics of the world and it's also changing the reward function. Um, I think that we only need to study one at a time because it, it can make the thing complicated if everything is changing. Um, so for me, it makes a lot more sense to study um, a changing reward function instead of changing dynamics. Okay, um, I think in the world, the, the, the dynamics are almost fixed. Like there's some uh, of course, like, here's a stupid example. Um, maybe 
um, somehow my my laptop maybe there's an, a similar laptop that has a different weight okay so that means i would i cannot from my observations i cannot know how it's going to move so in some sense the the dynamics of the world they're not really fixed uh, when i can only observe uh, uh, I, I cannot infer the dynamics of the world just from my current observation is what i'm trying to say but I think that it's much more interesting to study this idea of reward functions that are changing, right? I can, if I want to work on current curriculum learning or if I want to accumulate skills in the real world, um, for me, it's uh, a skill, for example, in a manipulation task would be to, for example, reach um, a cup. And then maybe if I'm thirsty, I'm going to bring the cup to my face. So to, to create these skills, I need a changing reward function, right? Um, I need a reward function that, that's going to get me to my cup. I need a reward function that's gonna, that's gonna tell me, okay, now bring the cup to my face. So I think changing reward functions is much more exciting than changing dynamics. So that's just my personal take, but I think that's how we should study uh, task uh, that's how we should study continual reinforcement learning. And now we, we've, we've essentially circled back to what is task agnostic continual RL, okay? So essentially, it's just, so if you have played with uh, continual supervised learning, uh, and if you know task agnostic continual learning, well, task agnostic continual RL is just equivalent. Um, I have uh, these certain tasks and they're gonna change uh, my data distribution here. Uh, and in my case, they change just the reward function. And um, yeah, so that's basically um, what I refer to as task agnostic continual RL. And I think it's really aligned with the use case of, or at least it's a good place to study reinforcement learning if you're interested in this little agent in the world that accumulates knowledge and skills and becomes generally intelligent. So hopefully that's clear. Um, if there's questions at the end, if that was not clear, we can chat about that. Um, as a literal summary, uh, just to re-explain task agnostic continual RL, you start from the palm DP, you assume locally stationary hidden state, which will make the environment non-stationary. Um, and then you assume passive non-stationarity. So what I mean by that is the agent has no control on the non-stationariness of the world or has no control on this task. And then we've made the potentially really big hidden state just a single categorical variable. Okay. So that's task agnostic continual reinforcement learning. There's um, a, oh, a you want question to on the YouTube, which is why yeah, is please, the state... I'm... Yeah, I'm just going to read out the question on the YouTube, which is why is the state independent of the task here? Mm, what is, okay, so why is the state independent of the task? Um, so I guess that's a good question. Um, so I mean that's that's kind of what we did when we removed the dynamic the dynamics of the world. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say a stupid example. Um, if my task is to go to the kitchen, uh, sorry, to, to, to cook some food, well, I don't need the dynamics of the world to change. I can just, you know, get to um, the kitchen. So I don't need the states to be dependent on the task, um, but I'm happy to discuss this further if someone thinks differently. Um, and yeah, please, if you have more questions, please interrupt me anytime. Uh, okay, so now we're going to talk about soft upper bounds that we use in um, task agnostic continual RL research. Um, and the first one is, and if, if you've been doing some research in continual learning, you've most likely already used these bounds. Okay, so the first one is the task awareness of upper, upper bound. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, if we just go back to this guy, 
the task characteristic continual RL. If I give my agent, if my agent can observe this task variable, basically the problem be collapses to an MDP, right? And now the agent doesn't need to infer this hidden variable. So this is what we'll refer to as a task awareness upper bound. It's a basically um, now the for this agent the world becomes uh, fully observable, and this will tell us like our method how much it performs compared to this upper bound or for, to the task awareness task awareness baseline. It will tell us how much we were losing in performance by having to do task inference. Okay, um, so that's one upper bound. And we'll, we'll talk later about how we can actually instantiate those uh, upper bounds. The other upper bound is what I call the multitask soft upper bound. So when we, as we said earlier, when we train on non-stationary data, there is some challenges, uh, mostly forgetting. And um, one way to understand how much is lost in performance uh, come, uh, by having to learn on non-stationary data is just to run the same algorithm but on stationary data. Okay, so uh, this baseline it doesn't need to learn continually; it learns everything at the same time. And then you can tell by the gap between your met uh, your method in continual learning versus your method in multitask learning how much is lost because of non-stationarity. Okay, so that that's two upper bounds. That are that you can use in continual reinforcement learning research or in continual learning, in continual supervised learning. And um, yes, so this is not meant for you to uh, read right now off of the slides. But if you are interested in the different um, scenarios or the different PMDPs and NDPs I've talked about in the paper, I will send at the end we've kind of like have a nice uh, mathematical framework to quickly understand how different the different uh, MDPs are, okay? Um, okay, so now we're kind of slowly converging to the empirical paper we've just written. And um, so I'll talk about the methods in the, and basically the first thing we need to address is that in task agnostic continual RL, um, there's a problem of partial observability, right? I need to perform some actions in the world. I, I mean, to collect some data with the environment in order to infer which task I'm in, okay? So I need to in, basically infer the task variable that's hidden from me. Another way to think about this is like, um, Earlier, I said that um, in the PMDP, to take optimal actions, the agent would need to basically condition itself on all of the previous time scales, which definitely doesn't scale. So one way you can um, fix this problem is to learn a working memory. Okay, so in this case, this working memory is a Z. Okay, so basically now I'm learning this latent variable z which basically encode all the information of the past that i can that the agent should use when it's trying to take uh, actions okay so if we go back to the um building a house robot well probably this robot in its working memory is going to put some things like the state of the house what his friends are currently working on, and then this working memory is going to be useful at any time step uh, for the agent to continue the current subtask it's currently doing in the project of building the house. Okay, so one simple way to create this working memory is to add a recurrent neural net to your reinforcement learning algorithm, okay? So basically, this recurrent uh, uh, neural net, it 
input will be the uh, its pa its past um, representation, and it will be the observations, actions, and reward of the environment. And then with this, the RNN is able to predict the next uh, working memory or the next representation of the of the world. So um, here, the, the, the RNN basically it's parameterized by all of these purple arrows. Okay, so um, here uh, it's really really simple. I'm just I have a reinforcement learning algorithm which we'll talk about later, and now I'm just simply mounting an RNN on top of it, and this should help me. So the, this RNN is big. Its job will be to infer. Um, basically the task variable to help the the rest of the of the agent uh, perform its current the task it's currently in okay so that was a mouthful hopefully it was somewhat clear um but we'll talk about this rnn much more so you should be fine um so that's the first problem we needed to tackle this partial observability problem um and then there is the other problem of um having uh, forgetting when you're doing continual learning right so um because we're studying a continual uh, learning scenario there's forgetting so we need a trick to fix that and in this paper we're simply or in the rest of this presentation we're simply going to use experience replay as um as our continual learning backbone algorithm. Okay, so basically, in the in the work that I'm presenting, uh, we've come we've simply combined an RNN with this idea of experience replay, where you uh, have a buffer, you you keep a buffer of old data, and you simply retrain on it from time to time. We've simply combined this, which I guess was hasn't been done before somehow and we've got really really good results uh with that baseline like um uh, you will, you'll see later what kind of results i'm talking about but uh really surprising results if you uh, ask uh, the continual learning researcher me okay so that's so we'll call basically this idea of combining the rnn with experience replay uh, replay base recurrent rl or pre rl um, and then in the experiments that I'm going to show you, basically the baselines are pretty simple. Um, I have a fine tuning baseline. So basically it's just a neural net that goes through the data as if it was, as if there was no continual learning. It's just um, always training on the current day, on the current task. We have um, this experience replay uh, baseline, as I just said. And then we have the multitask baselines. Basically, these baselines, they, they are, they enjoy, they, they can learn on stationary data. Those don't have to deal with continual learning problems. Okay. So that kind of the three strategies will build on. And then, as I said, um, that if we want to compute, if we want to task awareness upper bound, we need some methods that will leverage the task ID. Okay. So one really simple way that works really well to do this is just uh, to use a multi-head approach. So basically now my agent, it's in terms of parameters. For all tasks, it's gonna share a trunk. So basically for all tasks, the, the agent is gonna have the same uh, uh, representation of the world, but then each each task they have their own head and the task can choose what's the best action given the shared state representation of the world so uh it's a really really simple baseline um and uh if that wasn't clear maybe i can uh, explain it better um at the end um so that's one simple way to have a task aware baseline and then another way is just to add the um, task variable to the input of the agent and let the agent uh, figure out what it wants to do with it. So that's two ways of having task awareness baseline. And what we would expect 
is for the methods that don't have access um, to this uh, task variable to perform poorly compared to those baselines. But maybe I have a surprise for you. Um, then there is a reinforcement learning backbone we've used throughout all of the experiments. Um, and I guess now it's a good time to tell you that uh, the experiments are basically manipulation tasks uh, in continuous space, okay? So I will talk about the benchmark in two minutes, but you need to know before I explain this backbone that the space is continuous, the action space is continuous. Okay, so like, how am I going to move my end next to do certain manipulation tasks? Um, okay, so I'm going to explain the SAC backbone or the SAC algorithm really quickly. Um, hopefully, you get a grasp of it. So we'll start with Q learning. Uh, Q learning is this really simple uh, algorithm where, um, and now it's assume a discrete space. Okay, so assume a finite number of states and assume a finite number of actions, okay? Basically, Q learning is going to learn a matrix that is states by action. And basically, uh, in this matrix, it will tell you, it, it, it will learn the values of those state action pairs. So in a particular state, how valuable is it to perform this particular action, okay? So basically, Q learning is about learning this matrix. Now, um q learning doesn't really scale really well right let's think let's say we're in pixel space i'm definitely not gonna learn a matrix where um there is as much rows as pixel combinations that definitely doesn't scale well so we need a way to approximate this q function and what better way to approximate the function than deep learning so um, deep Q learning is basically just, oh yeah, I want to say something first. So go back, so go back. So in Q learning, um, I'm learning this matrix of value of, or of state action pairs. And then my policy is kind of implicit. Uh, when I'm in a particular state, I will just choose the most valuable action, okay? Uh, now, in DQ learning, um, or DQ that we call, or DQ learning, we, we call DQN. Um, now I'm replacing this uh, matrix by a neural network that will always give me, um, it will output the values of state action pairs, okay? So now, uh, even if my state space is humongous, my neural network is gonna approximate the value of uh, the states and give me um, the values of uh, all the actions that can, that, and then I, so it's going to give me the values of all the possible action in this particular state. And again, the policy is implicit. I'm just going to choose the action that's the most valuable for that particular state. Okay. Um, but again, this trick it cannot be applied if the actions are continuous, right? Because if they're discrete, it's fine. I get a value for all, all of the all of the uh, all of the actions that I can perform. But if um, the actions are continuous, I don't have the luxury of just picking the right action. Um, so this is where SAC comes in, okay? Or soft actor critic. So basically now. Let me try to get this well. Um, in SAC, we're still learning a Q function. We're still approximating it with a neural net. But now we're going to actually learn an explicit policy. Okay, So pi is not implicit anymore. It's another neural network. And basically, its job is to maximize the Q function. So basically, the Q function, which we often call the critique, and the policy, which we often call an actor, um, the critique is going to learn the how how certain all the action and value and state pairs. It's going to learn its values, and then the 
through gradient descent, um, the actor is going to learn what it should do in the world through the critic. So if you squint your eyes a bit, it looks a bit like a generative adversarial network where a discriminator trains a generator, right? The generator, basically the only thing it, 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 it's, val it's, uh, it's learning is as good as the discriminator, right? It learns everything from the discriminator. So here it's like a bit of the same game. Um, the policy uh, or the actor is as good, cannot be better than what the critique says because the actor is learning everything from the critic. So now this gives us a way, this gives us an explicit policy that will tell us what action to take in action space. So if you don't have a reinforcement learning background, maybe this is not super clear, but um, just think about a, um, now we have a reinforcement learning that can learn on large state space and continuous uh, action spaces, okay? That's called SAC, and it works uh, really well. Uh, it's my favorite RL algorithm. Um, so now we need to talk about, um, we need to talk about benchmarks in continual reinforcement learning. And this is really, really key to um, the conclusions I will try to, I will circle back to later. Okay, so my opinion is that in continual reinforcement learning, the benchmarks that people are doing are, the, the task in those benchmarks are either too similar or they're either too different, okay? So in one part of the space, maybe researchers uh, create uh, benchmarks using these uh, cute uh, Mujoko tasks, okay? So here we have what they call an ant that's moving in a particular direction, okay? So basically, our researchers will create tasks uh, in this benchmark would be uh, a task is a direction I should walk to. But between me and you, if you can walk in a direction, you can probably walk in all directions. So I think this is, this is really not exciting for me for to develop new continual reinforcement learning, learning strategies because essentially all tasks are the same. They're just slight variations. So accumulating knowledge there it doesn't mean we're gonna be able to accumulate knowledge in the real world. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of continual reinforcement learning work has been done on Atari. Um, now in Atari, if you don't know, it's like a suite of uh, games from the 80s. And um, now it's just the opposite. From one game to the other, it's really unclear what can be transferred, uh, what, how, it's really unclear if accumulating knowledge <laughs> will be good for future tasks. So basically, the input spaces, they are completely different. Uh, so the, the domain of, the, of these um, games has an overlap in between the games. And also, the reward function is just completely different, right? The, like playing a game of Pong, the reward function is completely different from playing Mario, right? So uh, it's really unclear what you can transfer. The only thing I can see the agent transferring is like these idea related to object bias. Like for example, objects seem to not teleport. So maybe that's something you would like to transfer <laughs> from one game to the other. But for me, I think tasks are too dissimilar. So we need to find a benchmark that is kind of has, the tasks are different, but still they're similar enough to encourage a forward transfer. So this is why I've convinced myself that um, doing manipulation tasks is a good playground for continual reinforcement learning. Um, so I've been playing for the rest, for the experiments, I've played with a meta world, which is a suite of 50 um, manipulation tasks, okay? So basically, the dynamics of the worlds are fixed, as I said earlier, but now, from task to task, the reward function is changing. But the reward, all the reward function, they share a series structure, 
they all have a grasping component, a placing component, a reaching component that are combined in different ways. There's objects that are with different sizes and connectivity that will reappear. So for me, it's really conductive to, uh, to this idea of like um, being able to learn a new task quicker by the means of having accumulated knowledge. Okay, so I think that this is uh, the problem with the, the uh, meta world or its continual version, uh, continual world, is that it requires a lot of compute to run the experiments, as does Atari. But uh, you know, it's the it's the price we have to pay. Okay, so now we're gonna dive into uh, the empirical findings of the paper. Okay, so now I'm gonna first show. Um, some continual learning performances on different uh, benchmarks I've created with MetaWorld. So here, uh, for example, so vertically, each vertical line represents a uh, task change. And uh, the performance I'm reporting is the global performance on all tasks the agent should learn. Okay, So, so this is why the performance is, is, is increasing over time. So here's their 10 task, and here's their 20 task. And what is really surprising uh, is that somehow the baseline I've discussed earlier, okay, this idea of, of adding an R and N to end all um, partial observability, it seems to always perform the best, no matter where I, I've play, I've tried it, okay. But this is really surprising because the intuition is that um, the RNN, if it if it does the task inference jobs perfectly, it can only be as good as the task aware method that are observing the task variable. Okay, but now somehow this baseline is beating its soft upper bound. It's better than the task aware baseline, so it must be doing something more than task inference. And we'll we'll circle back to this uh, really quickly because before I want to talk about another observation that I've made with this really awesome baseline, which is that okay. So now again, you see uh, the continual learning performances of uh, the continual learning algorithm, and in the back you see their multitask learning analog. Okay, so basically. It's this, the same algorithms, but they don't need to learn on continual learning data. So the gap between uh, at the end of the training, the continual learner has been exposed to all tasks. So the ta the gap between uh, it, the, the continual learning performances and the multitask learning performance should tell us how much forgetting appeared. And surprisingly, this benchmark is at this baseline, 3RL, is as good on non-stationary data um, as it is on stationary data. And this, this is me falling out of my chair because the, the first thing you, you hear, the axiom of continual learning, is that uh, when you train deep learning on non-stationary data, it's going to suffer from catastrophic forgetting. And then we do endless experiments, and then you, you, you kind of see how, catastrophic, how bad catastrophic forgetting is. And then you sort of believe it, that it must happen everywhere, and you start working on catastrophic forgetting. But here, when we try to get as close as, po as currently possible to this idea of like deploying this, these autonomous continual reinforcement learning agent in the world, doing really cool tasks that relate to each other, well, now, uh, if you do the specific baseline of using an RNN for part of the partial observability problem and using experience experience replay to handle uh, the forgetting, then somehow the performance of the algorithm is as good. It, it, it's not, yeah, yeah it's, it's, you train it on non-stationary data or you train it on stationary data, performance is the same. So, um, and then the rest of the presentation, I'm, we're gonna try to see why this baseline works so well. Why is it? Why is it beating or reaching so what we pre previously thought about uh, soft upper bounds? 
And then why I think this result is super exciting is that now for me, working on catastrophic forgetting, it's not super exciting. What's really exciting to me is working on forward transfer. But if somehow for my use cases, um, catastrophic forgetting is not a problem, then that means for me, I can start working on for forward transfer. So I'm really excited about this result. So we're gonna dive into it. We're gonna try to, uh, so we're gonna go through some hypothesis as to why this uh, baseline or the RNN is able to, um, it's the only one that can beat, well, why is it able to beat the task awareness upper bound? And why is it as good in continual learning than in multitask learning? And then we'll start with the boring hypothesis and then we'll get to the sexy ones, okay? So the first one that we need to get out of the way is that maybe this RNN is simply better at learning tasks individually than um, just having a single uh, MLP. So the same version without the RNN. Uh, so maybe that's why it's getting, maybe that's why it's able to beat the multi-head approach or whatever. It's just because it's a better tool to learn one task or one MDP, which would be kind of surprising. But we'll, we'll because essentially if, as we said earlier, if you're learning an MDP, you don't need a working memory because you're, uh, everything you need is in the state variable that you're observing. But nevertheless, we'll test for the hypothesis that maybe the RNN improves single task performance, okay? So now what I did is I um, retrained, uh, so I've trained SAC and SAC plus RNN on all the tasks individually and I average the performance, and somehow uh, it looks like the RNN is hurting single task performance, okay? So we're quickly gonna discard this hypothesis that the RNN is just better at learning single task um, independently. So it has to do with uh, continual learning. Okay, um, so now you've seen uh, maybe I'll, oh. sorry, maybe I'll interrupt you before you go into the next hypothesis yeah. because we have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Perfect. the more uh, easy question to answer is uh, someone's asking um, basically which precise reference this is referring to and whether it is published. Um, I assume you um, may put that at the end, but you can also just say it now. Yeah, uh, if you Google task agnostic continual RL, I'm guessing it might be the first thing, task agnostic continual RL. If it's not, you need, well, for me it is, of course, but if it's not, you know what, I'll just send it to you and you can share it with the world. Uh, there we go, bing, 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 there we go. It's called task agnostic continual RL in praise of a simple baseline. And uh, it's not published yet but uh, hopefully, maybe it is one day, we'll see. But it can be hard to publish empirical <laughs> studies that don't have novel methods. So uh, yeah, we'll see. Okay, and now maybe the uh, topic question Hi. from a different person. Uh, it is, um, it's two questions basically related and it is, I'm reading it out. Do you consider mm -hmm. tasks that have the same observations but different rewards or is the yeah. task identifiable from the observation? Uh, that's a really, really good question. So it would beat the purpose um, of task agnostic continual RL if the task was directly inferable from one observation. Uh, so essentially, there's no way for the agent to know from one observation which task it's in. Um, the agent absolutely needs to collect some state action reward states, trajectories, and do inference on them to correctly identify the task. Um, so yeah, so okay, so, and then it's kind of confusing because when you look at the benchmark here, the visual rendering, so the agent doesn't see these pixels. The agent sees uh, the, the state uh, of the, the program, 
But here you would say, oh, it's kind of really easy to do inference because uh, in the basketball game, well, there's a basketball lying down, right? So I should be able to infer the task in one observation. But the agent doesn't see this. It sees, this is just a visual rendering for the human. Um, so yeah, there's some work to be done to infer the task correctly. That's a great question. And then there was a second part? Uh, that was already second quote, but there's a separate related, uh, non, sorry, there's a separate non-related additional question, okay. which is, um, I'm trying to read it out, it's uh, in two parts. It starts with, have you tried the same algorithm without the RNN to also answer question one? So saying the SAC without the RNN on multitask, but with a higher number of parameters to compensate the loss of parameters of yes. the occurrence. <laughs> yes, that's a really good question. Okay, so... Actually, we did. It's in the appendix of the paper. And uh, also on that front, multi-head has more parameters than the RNN. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we've completely made sure it's not a question of just having more parameters, which is a great, great question. So, so basically in the appendix, we have like, We've tried everything with bigger nets, and it's always worse. So meta world, it's really a tricky uh, benchmark uh, environment where you need like you need um, a certain architecture architecture with a certain learning rate and a certain batch size for things to work properly. So um, yeah. Um. Yeah, and I guess now is a, a lot of questions coming up. So <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. No, so it's much. a good. Uh, no, it's feel... a good time to. Uh, Okay, please feel free to also tell people to, um, if, it, if you feel like it's more uh, sensible to ask questions later, that's also okay. Otherwise, I'll just continue reading them out, um, yeah. which is, uh, could you please clarify the notion of a task? Is a state machine with a terminate state question mark? Um, is it, I guess, there's an it missing. Um, okay, so the notion of a task here, is, at least in meta world, it's just... Um, what it controls, what is the reward function? So if I'm in the basketball game, uh, this task is going to give me rewards for reaching the basketball and grasping it and then throw, placing it in the, the hoop. Um, so this task variable, it's, it's only hopping between different reward functions that share components. Uh, so they share a grasping component, they share reaching components, and so on and so on. So I'm not sure if I've answered the question. Uh, if I didn't, maybe uh, the, the question asker can rephrase this question. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we can see there's a small uh, YouTube delay. So maybe there's going to be a post um, sort of text coming up. I think someone on Teams also raised a, a hand to ask a question in, in voice. I don't know yeah, if it's sure. still... Philip Wolf. Yeah, so feel yep. free to do uh, that also. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, great. Um, I'm wondering, is the graph there to prove your hypothesis? Oh, actually, it's to disprove the hypothesis. So, so, so yeah, we're so, gonna... yeah, I'm asking, because um, how do you make sure that this um, effect shown isn't random, but has some statistical significance? Mm. Okay, so that's a good question, because here it's kind of really tricky to, well, it's not tricky, but um, the, you know, there's some task that the agent is going to be able to perform well, and there's some task that the, that the agents are not going to be able to perform well. So essentially, I've got some runs that are like in the average success is like 100% and some runs where it's zero. So the standard deviation of this guy, of these guys is like humongous. So um, it's hard to, um, to tell if, uh, it's hard to perform a test that would tell me if it's significant or not. But um, at least over 100, different trials, um, it looks like the RNN performs much worse. So um, 
the 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 hypothesis that the i the i the RNN performs better is definitely not as significant, right? There's no way it could be significant. Um, hopefully, that's addressed. Okay. Okay, I, I understand. Thank you very much. Martin, you want to ask more questions, or was that it? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you guys that hypothesis one should be discarded, which brings us to hypothesis two. So I'm sure that you've seen um, some continual learning methods in your continual learning class. And what most of them do is increase the stability of the learning agent because there's this plasticity stability trade-off and na na naively unrolling a neural net that is a too plastic approach so we're kind of trying to with methods we're trying to move around in the in this space of stability plasticity we need more stability to remember everything but not to, to learn new things so a lot of continual learning methods, they will increase stability. So the RNN, because it's somehow not suffering from catastrophic forgetting, uh, maybe an hypothesis is that the RNN is able to increase the stability of uh, you know, the parameters or the knowledge. So how could we test for this? What we did is, um, We've, for each epoch of learning, okay, which in our case is um, doing, gathering 500, gathering one episode in the, in, the, um, in the environment, which is 500 steps, and then performing 500 gradient steps. So that's an epoch. For each epoch, we're going to look at how much the parameters are moving, okay? So we're, we're looking at, how much uh, each parameters have moved during the epoch. And then we're going to compute the entropy of the movements across all the parameters, okay? So essentially, if all of the parameters have moved uniformly, um, which would mean that there's, not, there's, no, there's no stability, um, then I will reach a really high entropy because this distribution would be uniform. But if somehow there are some parameters that are moving less, um, so basically kind of like freezing knowledge, then I would see a drop in this entropy, which would mean that the stability has increased. Okay, so hopefully that was clear. But here you see the entropy I've just discussed, and you see. Uh, on the x-axis, the, the all the time steps uh, during the learning of the agent. And what's happening is actually the opposite. So for all the methods, they will kind of start to stabilize. And then as they learn more and more tasks, the parameters are like starting to move around even more than before, which is counterintuitive. But uh, nevertheless, it's kind of clear that the RNN doesn't improve the stability of the knowledge, uh, at least not in, not the stability uh, um, in in terms of parameters, um, which we usually try to increase with continual learning methods. So I hope that was clear. Um, but essentially, we're discarding this idea that somehow maybe the RNN is able to stabilize the neural net parameters like EWC does or like PACnet does and so on and so on. Which leaves us to hypothesis number three, which is the sexy hypothesis that I like. Um, and now I'll, I'll try to be, I'll try to be con conscious of not using the term hierarchical reinforcement learning because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, and for context, uh, if people don't know this idea of hierarchical reinforcement learning, 
is is a framework where where basically you're able to stitch together different sub policies to create um, more interesting policies. So, for example, maybe I'm I have this task of cooking dinner. I could decompose this task into uh, making a sandwich and making a drink and so on and so on. And then I could have policies for all of these subtasks and then hierarchical reinforcement learning would like stitch together these subtasks to create the new ta the new policy the new skill of doing dinner okay so that's kind of hierarchical reinforcement learning but i don't want to get in trouble so i'm not going to talk about hierarchical reinforcement learning instead i'm going to propose the following hypothesis which is that the rnn correctly places the new task in the context of previous ones okay so what do i mean by that let's take a really really simple example this uh, there's an agent and the first task it's doing it's learning to reach uh, objects okay uh, learning to reach a mug learning to reach a laptop and then the second task is to learn how to open a door so uh, ha, uh, as the agent is learning uh, this new task of opening the door, maybe the RNN, while it's, so the first part of opening a door is to reach the doorknob, right? So maybe when the RNN, when the agent is doing some exploration, in the first part of the episode where you're supposed to reach the doorknob, Maybe the RNN recognizes uh, the state action and reward trajectories as uh, reaching uh, trajectories. So basically, maybe the RNN can tell the agent, hey, we've seen these before. This is a reaching task. Let's just reuse knowledge learned previously to quickly learn this task of opening a door. So that's what I mean by recontextualizing the new task in the previous ones okay so this is kind of my favorite hypothesis and it's really hard to directly test this hypothesis so but what we can do is if this hypothesis is true it will have certain effects and we that's kind of how i will go about this hypothesis so first effect that this hypothesis would have if it was true is that the RNN would learn faster than the other methods, right? Because it doesn't need to relearn again uh, how to uh, open the door. Uh, it, I mean, it's going to learn faster the opening a door if it can quickly understand that the first part is reaching the doorknob and reuse its reaching skill, OK? So this is a really, really bad figure, but I'm going to try to explain to you what's happening and why it's segmented into. But here, now we're looking at the current performance of the algorithm and not the global performance. OK, so this is why the performance is going up. And when the task changes, it goes down and then it goes up a bit and then back down and so on and so on. OK. And um, so now I have the I have three RL, I have just replay, I have a multi-head and fine-tuning with a multi-head, but those are not super important. I also have um, the method that will just learn from scratch every time. And I have this, and I call this independent. And I also have uh, the independent, but with an RNN. And what we can see is in the, so, okay, so one thing I need to say, which kind of sucks, is that in, in meta world, some tasks are really hard. So they cannot be learned in like a million time step, which is what I'm doing. So for example, task one here, uh, task six, like, you know, the performances are really, really bad. So they're not learned. And sometimes, Um, the freshly initialized model, so like the purple guy and the yellow guy. 
But so so but now we're only going to focus on the four tasks that the continual learners are actually able to learn. So that's like task this one, this one, this one, and this one. Okay. And now the first thing we need to see in these tasks is three RL, which is in black. It's always learning faster than the continual learners. Okay, so it's always the fastest continual learner on all of these tasks. And also, what's interesting, it's now this 3RL baseline in these tasks, it's also learning faster than the independent methods, which are essentially spend, spending all of their compute on the current task. They're not bothered with uh, spending some compute to remember the old task, right? So it's kind of amazing that 3RL is able to learn faster than these models, even though it's spending a lot of its compute on um, the past task. And now we definitely have some evidence that um, the RNN is able to learn faster um, than everyone. And which brings some evidence to this idea, I think, that um, the RNN is able to place the new task in the context of previous one, like um, contextualizing this opening the door inside the task of reaching. So, you know, there's some overlap in the reaching part. Not sure if that was clear. If that wasn't, please ask them questions. But I think this is some evidence that uh, hypothesis three is true, which is, if you squint your eyes a bit, it's kind of like, it has a hierarchical reinforcement learning flavor. But, you know, I didn't say that. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, here's another. Oh, Martin, you want to ask? Yeah, there is a question, which is, what's your educated guess on RNN versus transformer? Attention might also Ooh. learn to put attention on the end effector and the door handle and transfer these for each task. 100%. I mean, I think at this point, uh, everywhere that in RNN works, it would be interesting to try a transformer and probably the transformer would do better. Um, I've been wanted i've been wanting to try um but i didn't have time and then my internship at amazon ended uh but i definitely think we could get more points with that and there's a lot of work more in offline reinforcement learning where these transformers are being used and uh somehow they're performing really well so i think it's it's kind of related to the conclusion of my paper, which is like, it's good to have a, um, a working memory or it's good to sequential, to, to model the sequentiality of the problem. Uh, anyway, I'm taking a long detour, but I think it would be a great idea to swap the RNN with a transformer here. Long detour. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask you, there's no more questions. Okay, so, there was some evidence for task uh, for evidence for hypothesis three. Now another way, another effect that uh, hypothesis three would have uh, on the data. How long do I have? I have ten minutes left, right? If I understand correctly, Martin. If okay, but I okay, I think it will fit. I just maybe the questions. If there's some, it will go overboard. But okay, so uh, hypothesis three. Here's another effect it could have. Um, let's go back. Let's, let's take a new running example. Um, I'm a robot, and there is two tasks in my world. Okay, there's task one that pushes um, a cup, and there's task two that pulls a cup. Okay. Um, if I'm learning both of these tasks. Um, the first reaching part is the same, but once I've touched on the mug, now one task is telling me to push and the other is telling me to pull. So essentially, my the gradients are conflicting, right? Especially 
if I'm in a agnostic world where I don't know yet if I need to push or pull. I need to play with it and get rewards to understand if I need to pull or push. So what I'm trying to say is this: these tasks are going to cause a lot of gradient conflict. Um, if somehow I'm task aware, this uh, the conflict should be uh, reduced because now I know. Uh, I've at some point I've learned that when I reach the 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 cup, I just need to use the task ID to know if I need to push or pull. So at some point I'll get my I should have less um, conflict in my gradient. Now, if the agent is able to recontextualize the task together, my understanding is that there should be less gradient conflict, right? Like if I if I quickly infer that I need to push the mug, then the RNN tells me to, uh, to push. And if I quickly infer that I need to pull, the RNN tells me to pull. So I should have less gradient conflict if the RNN is able to contextualize all the tasks together. So one way what we can do is uh, we can look at the gradient conflict, which is what I did. Uh, so one way to measure gradient conflict is to look at the angle between the gradients of the task, okay? But personally, I think this is kind of a bad approach because it doesn't take into account uh, the, the magnet. So, okay, so here's what I, I'm trying to say. Let's, let's, see, uh, let's say you have two tasks. One task is telling you to go a bit to the right and the other one is telling you to go a bit to the left. Um, essentially, those gradients are not conflicting much. They're telling you to don't, don't stay close to where you are, okay? But their angle is going to be humongous. It's like they're completely pointing in different direction. Whereas if you have a gradient that tells you, hey, go a bit to the left, and the other gradient tells you, hey, go really far on the left, they have perfect angle alignment, but they're definitely not telling you to take the same step uh, in the space. So I think that gradient variance is a much better proxy of gradient alignment uh, or gradient conflict than um, looking at angles between gradients. So this is why in the paper we've looked at the variance of the gradient. Okay. So here on the x-axis, we have um, gradient variance, which is a proxy for gradient conflict. So the lower is better. And the first thing you can observe, so here in uh, the pale dots, there are just different seeds, and then I average them together to give me these full, fully opaque points. The first thing we can see is um, 3RL or the RNN is the one that has the most stable gradients or the most enjoys the most uh, alignment in the gradient which i think is it's, it's super nice it's it's even better than uh, the multi head in terms of gradient alignment and so i guess that, that kind of makes sense because the rnn is able to beat the um, multi head so i think that this places some this is some evidence for this hypothesis to be true and um, also here um, the size of the bubble is a proxy for the stability of the training. Um, so basically what I've monitored is uh, I've looked at the variance of the, the Q values during training and um, using this, this variance as a proxy for the stability of the training. And we can see, and this is in, I've, I've used the log space because the bubbles would be non-comparable. So even in log space, we can see that uh, the RNN enjoys more, more stable learning um, than the multi-head and the just experience replay approach. So uh, yeah, this is just a side fact. It, it looks like a true better graded alignment, uh, learning is stabilized, which would also explain why maybe the RNN is able to learn faster. So yeah, hopefully you are kind of convinced about hypothesis three. Hopefully you think that 
if you if you are going to run task agnostic continual RL experiment, you should at least have this baseline. Uh, in terms of experiments, I'll finish with some kind of qualitative um, support for hypothesis three. So here, now you're looking at the representation of the RNN throughout uh, an episode, okay? So uh, I have four tasks, and these are the representation before I start learning the first task, after I've learned one task, and after learning all tasks, okay? And basically, you, you, the representation starts at the star, and then you can, as it evolves, this is the representation throughout one episode, okay? So I hope that was clear. The first thing I wanna point out is, and if this relates to someone's question earlier, like, can you infer, um, the task from the first observation or from a, an observation. So the way, the way, the way, the way, the way meta world is set up, you're not, there's no way of understanding which task you're in from the first observation, but there is a lot of randomness in the first state. So essentially what we can see is before it trains, um, the first state representation is definitely not invariant to this randomness of the first state. So that means it, it So the first thing as I want to point out is as training evolves, those initial points are slowly converging, and at the end, they're kind of all at the same place, which means that the RNN correctly learned a task invariant initial representation. And it's gonna you do some work at the beginning to correctly infer the task. Okay. So another thing I want to point out is at the beginning of the training, you know, the trajectories are kind of like completely collapsing quickly. Okay. They're not, you know, they're not really rich trajectories. Okay. Uh, but as training evolves, those uh, trajectories are getting longer and longer and richer and richer. And at the end, um, for all tasks, the trajectories are, are pretty long and they kind of overlap in interesting ways, which tells me two things. It tells me two things. Maybe like for here, when I'm pointing here, maybe um, the, uh, I'm not gonna go there, but um, basically what we can see is if the agent was only doing task inference, there would be no need for the representation of the RNN to constantly evolve throughout an episode, right? It would just quickly collapse to a single point, which would be, um, which, would, which would represent a task. But here, all the tasks, they're kind of evolving throughout all the episode, which tells me that the RNN is feeding a fine-grained representation of all the tasks um, to the rest of the agent, which really it supports this hypothesis tree that basically the RNN is, you know, contextualizing new tasks in the previous ones. So, yeah, I know it's only qualitative, but I think it's kind of neat to see um, the representation of the RNN in 2D space, uh, and uh, I think it supports hypothesis three. Um, so that's my last slide discussion. Um, what does this mean for continual learning research? Well, if you're like me and you have a similar um, motivation, which uh, for continual learning, which is this idea of like deploying learning agents in the wild so that they can accumulate knowledge autonomously and so on and so on. If that's your motivation, then maybe you should study task agnostic continual reinforcement learning instead of um, task incremental learning on MNIST because it seems like they're completely different beasts. Um, we're not, there's a way to not have catastrophic forgetting and um, 
maybe now you can focus like being on forward transfer, uh, which I think is much more interesting than trying to solve negative backward transfer. And then another discussion point is why is this happening in continual supervised learning and not in continual reinforcement learning? I think one boring explanation for this that needs to be uh, discussed is um, when we do incremental classification, this action space or this prediction space keeps increasing and increasing, right? I'm adding some new class that I need to uh, continually be able to predict. And then somehow I'm using a softmax on, uh, normally I'm using a softmax on top of, um, I'm using a softmax to make my prediction. But a big difference in continual RL is that the action space is fixed, um, which means that I'm, I, I don't have to deal with this issue of like an increasing action space, which is in which adding a softmax is definitely going to lead me into trouble, right? Because uh, as I'm learning these new classes, the probability of my previous classes is slowly dropping and, and dropping and dropping. So um, basically, I'm losing I, the forgetting might be only happening in the last layer because of this softmax trick. And forgetting could be maybe a lot of forgetting could be just addressed by uh, having a, a method that has a better calibrated uh, way to do prediction, you know, maybe with nearest neighbor or whatever. Um, so that's one difference between continual supervised learning and continual reinforcement learning, which could explain why um, the results are so different. And then I guess there's also this idea that in the work in the work I presented, um, there was this clear transfer that is achievable between tasks. So maybe um, there is forgetting inside the methods. It's just it's compensated by the transfer that I'm able to achieve. Who knows? Um, it's just that when you do continual MNIST, it's unclear if the reward structure between task zero and one and task two and three, it's unclear if there's like, you know, reusable components there. Um, so maybe that's why I'm ending up with different conclusions than I am with continual MNIST. So that's some food for thought. And this concludes the presentation. Thanks for uh, bearing with me. If there's some. Yes, so um, thanks. So let me first thank you actually for the presentation. And I'm pretty sure that all the listeners, all the enthusiasts, all the students, um, all the people who will see it on YouTube later appreciate it a lot. Thank I um, see there already is one question. Uh, while I read that out, maybe others can think about their questions. Um, I guess mm -hmm. this one is still with respect to the empirical results, which is, do you have any comparison between 3RL and hierarchical RL algorithms? So going back to mm. your <laughs> infamous hierarchical yeah. algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Um, I don't, sadly. Um, so the thing is, hierarchical RL, like everyone believes in it. Everyone knows at some point it should work but it doesn't work really well today. Um, at least that's my understanding of it. So I think one popular framework inside hierarchical RL is this idea of options, right? I'm basically, my sub skills will be options like cooking an egg and cooking bacon. And then I will be able to run option one and then run option two. And then this will create a new skill of doing dinner. Um, but it's really, really hard to make options work. And I think it would be the, the, the current algorithms we have for options. I think it would be almost impossible to make them work on a uh, meta world because it's so high dimensional, like options, it can work. I think it works well in, uh, like little toy benchmarks with a really simple state space, but, uh, 
I don't, I really think it's a bad idea to try them in the world, at least in 2022. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the answer. I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Um, ah, okay. Other than that, I can uh, give you the virtual applause and the virtual thank yous in the YouTube chat that you're unfortunately not able to uh, get in person. Perfect. <laughs> but I'll so imagine there, there's a million people and everyone likes it. I'll just imagine. <laughs> right. So just so you feel appreciated, Perfect. even though you're talking to a wall on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can say that again. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, um, I guess if this is it, uh, good luck, everyone, with the so rest I'll, of yeah. the course. I'll, I'll thank you again. I'll um, end the stream after I uh, do a last final note. And then maybe if someone wants to ask on Teams a question without being on YouTube, um, they can do that uh, offline. Uh, for the online course, uh, for those of you listening, um, like I said in the beginning, this was the 11th uh, session. There will uh, be a last session next week on the frontiers of continual learning. Um, although I guess the frontiers of lifelong and continual learning, especially in an open world, uh, consisted of almost half the course already. So all of this mm. is to some degree frontiers, but we'll have a dedicated session on maybe the even more frontiers. Um, and of course, somewhat of a, of a course uh, summary next week. Um, and with that, I'll end the stream and hope to see you all next week. And let's thank our guest lecturer again. Uh, thanks a lot. See ya.